Well, let me, let me begin by humbling myself. Let me begin by humbling myself. You know, we just read out of First Peter the other day, as St. Jan Lutheran, right? That we have to be clothed with humility. And humility, as you know, is the toughest value that a Christian cultivates. And as you know, last week we talked about pride. So, of course, it is the opposite of pride, <laughs> you know. And uh, last, last uh, Thursday, I made a small mistake on my sermon, on my message, because I was moving fast. The music went too long. For some people didn't like it, I, I get there, so I apologize for that too, okay? So I am, I am, I am humbling myself this, morning, uh, this evening. Um, and I told you that there are 16 what? Prophets. And I know this by heart. And I gave you the reverse. I told you that there were four minors and 12 major. Well, that's, that's wrong. It is four major prophets and there are 16 minors. So please forgive me for uh, not telling you, huh? More than 12. You said 16. Well, 16 total. Yes, but that's not what you said. Of four major prophets and 12 minor yeah. prophets, 16 total. Yeah. And those are the prophets with the name. Yes. Now, I can go further than that. I can tell you about the classical prophets and they know, but, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. Amen. So, uh, 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 but I do listen, I do listen to my own sermons afterwards because they are being videotaped. And I want to make sure uh, I didn't give you any lies or any heretics, any, any heretics. So, number one. Number two, I want to also apologize because you know that what you see is what you get. I'm a real emotional guy. Not, not because I'm, I am Cuban, no. I am a Christian that happens to be Cuban, you see. I am no longer Cuban. I am a Christian that happens to be Cuban. Therefore, I have to let all the Cubanist stuff that is not from God get away because that could be hindering uh, me hallowing my father. So, the last few years, the last five or six years, uh, we have been going through a little bit of a journey here, you know, at many levels. And my heart is really, 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 really full. And I know that this series on Joshua has been uh, close to my heart. And we're dealing with many issues in the ministry and beyond. And my passion has gone a little further than it should have gone. And if some of you have felt scolded by me in the last few years, on this Joshua series, I want to ask for your forgiveness tonight because it is my intention uh, not to scold you. And sometimes my emotions about the church in America sometimes it spills out here and uh, you may not be the right audience for that and don't take it personally. It is because I am out there and I see what's going on. And as you know, I deal with people who are behind bars. And I deal with people getting out. And I deal with family members of those who are behind bars. And it hurts me to see how the church in America is treating them. They are not being welcomed. They are not being loved. And uh, that really hurts. So I take the gospel very, very seriously. I take Hebrews 13 very seriously when he said that we have to feel like, like the prisoners. We, we have to get in the, inside their skin. And sometimes the church doesn't do that. And that hurts. So, but I should not let that out. I have to be more working more in my own uh, prayer life that I will be able to be more self, more, more self 
um, control, but also be more careful in what I say and how I say. So I just wanted to say that tonight because I don't want people to feel, well, money is, 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 is spanking me. I'm not spanking you. I'm not God. I'm just a vessel. And I want to make sure that uh, tonight you will not feel that. So I, I even asked the Father, I said, Father, help me in my tone of voice. Help me, help me how I deliver the message, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, and, 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 and you know, I always say, and I've been applying that to my own self, my own medicine, that we have to fight for our joy. So, so that's a slide on the screen. Uh, we need to fight for our joy and for the joy of others. And that's what we're talking about tonight when we're looking at the life of Joshua. Amen. So I just wanted to apologize to you guys. And if you got offended by me, please forgive me. And if you feel that you still have to talk to me about this, I'm just an email away. I'm just a phone call away. I'm an easy guy to get in touch with. And I love you all and you my family. And I am humbled that we've been doing this for about six years right now. So we need to fight for that joy and the joy of others. And we have to allow the sweetness of the gospel to really take over us. Amen. Amen. And let me also say one more thing. Uh, and I want this to be also up there. Um, the vision that God gave me about six years ago for RTO is to cast a grandeur vision of the glory of God. Is to cast a grandeur vision of the glory of God. And that's what I want to do in every sermon. So I am recommitting myself tonight to do that because you see Jesus said in John 12 32 that I he said if I am lifted from the earth he says he will draw all people to himself and that is an amazing truth if we can lift Jesus up if we can exalt Christ and make much of his name and hence hallow the name of the Father in greater ways, then he will be happy, the Father will be happy, and Christ will draw people to say, we don't do the drawing, we don't do the saving, we, we don't have that kind of power. Only Christ can resurrect the dead. Only he can heal the hearts of those who are wounded, but we have to be the vehicle of mercy to them. So, so here's our title again for tonight. And it is, so Joshua arose. Joshua arose, part two. I just, just want us to um, remember that Joshua is what is the perfect picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. We call that what? Typology. He was a type of Christ. And it is my objective with this series on Joshua that we will all become like Joshua. That we will all become types of Christ. That we will all become types of Savior. And I've been challenged by Joshua in, in an amazing way. And this is the, the question that I've been wrestling with myself myself and this have to be and you feel free to get back to me because i want to hear from you as i heard from you last week and i send you a text to some of you and i wanted to hear back from you what do you think about this series of joshua and i know that we spend maybe way too much time on it but you know what it is so much in this book of joshua so we only on chapter eight so far but this is the question what motivated joshua to arise without delay what motivated joshua to arise without delay and why is it that it takes me so long to obey you see our obedience to God our father must be driven by our love for our father our obedience 
to God our Father must be driven by our love for the Father. In other words, the immediate obedience that God the Father required from Joshua and Jesus and him from all of us, that must lead us to the cross as we sang tonight. And through the cross, as his legitimate children, must be a hundred percent driven by the kind, radical, unselfish, and fearless love we have seen clearly displayed and demonstrated in Joshua and in Jesus Christ Himself. Empowered by what? By the unlimited power of the Holy Spirit given to us by our God the Father, who is the Father of the how much more? He's the Father of the how much more? So listen to this powerful text that we all know by heart. Very familiar text, but you see, sometimes the familiar becomes unfamiliar because we take it for granted. And we're talking about that I believe that the reason that Joshua arose is because he felt loved by his father. He felt that love. Christ came to our level and went to the cross because he was convinced 100%, 100% that his father loved him. When you know that somebody loves you, you would do anything for that person. And Joshua was convinced that his father is love. And I want us to feel love by God. If nobody else loves you, God says, I am love. He is love. No matter what is going on in your life. God says, I love you no matter what. And I have given my love to you through Jesus Christ. In Christ, I have given you my love. And here's what the word says. This is John 3, 14. I'm going to begin in verse 14 because I want you to see something very critical here. The reason that Christ came is because God the Father does not want you and I to perish. To perish. I don't know if we really know that. God loves us so much because he's in Christ because he does not want you and I to pray. And I want to make that connection tonight. Joshua didn't want the people to perish either. Here it is. And Moses, who was who? Joshua's mentor. And Moses, and as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted that whoever, hello, whoever believes in him should not what? Perish, but have what? Eternal life. And here it is. For God so loved the world. The Japanese church, the Mongolia church, the Indian church, the Spanish church, that he gave his only begotten. There is no other one like Christ. That whoever believes in him should not what? Should not perish. But have what? Everlasting life. That begins the moment that you trust Christ. And here it is. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to love us but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? From the justifiable wrath of God. Now let me connect you now with the Old Testament because this is important. I told you last week that a third of the New Testament is Old Testament interpretation. That's why we are biblicists. Now look at Numbers 21. 5 through 9 and look at the people's confession of sin it is very important that we confess our sin even when we think that we didn't do nothing wrong just because somebody got offended we cannot be defensive we must be teachable 
A Christian is a, is a true Christian when we become teachable. And we listen to other people's opinion, even if we don't agree. We have to listen. The people finally confess their sin because the root is pride, isn't it? And look how Moses responded. He prayed. He prayed. Now look at Numbers beginning uh, 21, beginning in verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. The guy who is representing Christ. And they say to Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die, to perish in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water. Now they saw the biggest miracle ever. They saw the biggest escape from prison ever. All those lifers got out of prison, out of Egypt. They saw God open the Red Sea. And don't you think that God would do it again? Of course he would do it again. He loves us. And he wanted to have more of a testimony. For, the, for there's no food and no water. And our soul loves this worthless bread. They, they, they don't like the food. So you know what the Lord did? Give a little taste of his wrath. A little taste of his wrath. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they beat the people. And many of the people, what? They perish. They perish. Many people are perishing today. Even when we take communion, we have to be careful how we take communion. We have to be careful that we examine ourselves before we, we partake of the bread and of the wine or of the juice. Therefore the people came to Moses desperate now and said, We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Moses, Moses, pray. How come they couldn't pray themselves? How come they couldn't pray? Because many are treating and they were treating God their father as what? As a paramedic. We could be like Moses. We could be like Joshua. We could pray like them. If we are willing to cultivate an intimate relationship with the Father. And we don't come to the Father for stuff. We don't come for anything. We come for everything that he's given us. Because we are grateful. And he, and he prayed. And what happened? God brought the healing. So he says... So he says that he take away the serpents. We don't want these serpents. So Moses prayed for the people. Look at verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, a type of, and set it on the pole. And it shall be that everyone who is beaten, when he looks at it, shall live and be healed. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the pole. And so he was, if a serpent had beaten anyone, then he took at the bronze, then he looked at the bronze serpent and he lived. Do you see the connection there? In John 3, 14 and Numbers 21, that he's saying, Jesus, that when we look to Jesus, we will not perish. That's why we look to, to nobody else. We look to Jesus. And the serpent that was put on this pole, and people look at it, they, they were able to live the same way we have to be looking at Jesus to live. And that is the heart of RTO. And that's what's the heart of Joshua. Now let me go back to our text from last week which is Matthew 22, 37 through 40, and then Matthew 7, 12, which is the golden rule. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment, 
and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets therefore whatever you want men to do to, uh, to do to you or for you do also for them for this is the law and the prophets that the golden rule and as you know I told you that what hinders us from loving God with all of our heart with all of our mind with all of our soul and to love our neighbor is what is pride and I define pride for you let me just do it again pride is what is a contaminated self that prevents Christians from being delivered by Yahweh and from arising like Joshua and Jesus did to accomplishing their father's given radical conquering mission every Christian has to become a, a Joshua because God says I want you to conquer to conquer without casualties and we have way too many people dying because they are being beaten by the serpent and we are not giving them the prescription for them to be healed and to live and I want to make sure that we give people at RTO the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ Christ crucified Christ, Christ resurrected we need to proclaim the blood of Christ we have to give Christ a more Christ and in Joshua I see Christ I see him so tonight I want to tell you that we cannot love God our Father nor our neighbor as we are commanded by Scripture from a distance. But rather we must love God our Father and our neighbor all close and personal. We call that what? Tabernacle. We must tabernacle as Jesus did. Jesus pitched his equipped tent. Hence, we must do the same. Listen to John 1.14. If you didn't have a philosophy of ministry, here it is. Here it is. John 1.14 says, And the word Jesus, the word incarnate, became flesh. In Spanish, carne became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory hallelujah his 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 glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and if we are preaching the word of God if we are teaching God's word we must proclaim this gospel in the tension of truth and grace and that's difficult and that's difficult to do because sometimes we proclaim too much truth and no grace that's called legalism and sometimes we preach too much grace and no truth that's called what entitlement and we cannot do that nothing comes for free it costs the father his son Jesus so tonight not only do we have to love our father and our neighbor all close and personal by pitching our equipped tent with them, but we must also love God our father and our neighbor creatively. Creatively. So my two points tonight are this. We must pitch our tent with our neighbors and get dirty with them because John 1.14 says that I have to get my tent equipped I have to pitch my tent and I must get dirty with people. Dirty with people. We are not very clean people. People have messes. And second point tonight is we must love creatively. There's not one little way of loving people. People have different needs. So I want to close tonight with two examples. You know, when Barbara and I were called to this ministry uh, almost 30 years ago, you know, 28 years ago, there were many 
good people doing prison ministry. Many. And many good people going into prisons. And we were very grateful for that. But then we began to investigate as rookies. And just imagine me and Barbara newly married. We come from two different cultures, as you know. She's German, I'm Cuban, I'm a new Christian. I mean, she, she was born in the church. Came from a good family, I was all messed up. I mean, I went to prison. I mean, and she marries me, that's another miracle. But we, we got married. You know why we got married? You know why we got married? Because God put us together. And he gave us a mission. He said to us, I want you to get married because together you will be able to serve me much more effectively than separate. That's, right. That's why we got together. Do we have issues? You better believe we have issues. But we're not quitting. We're working at it. And in the last seven years, we have discovered that we cannot make it without prayer. So anyway, so we saw a big need that this gospel that I've been talking about tonight was missing a little part, a very important part. You see, if, 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 if I only tell you about this Jesus like I have done so far and I'm missing this little point, I just lied to you. I have not given you the whole truth. And I have not given you grace because I have to tell you now that this gospel says that Christ is coming back. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. He's coming back. That's my hope. There's no hope for the Christian if we do not know and are convinced that this Jesus is coming back to rescue me and take me home because he went to prepare. Hallelujah. A place for me. He went to prepare my home honeymoon suite. Hallelujah. John 14. And we were convinced that we had to meet these guys at the prison gate. That's crazy. And we believed that we had to put these guys with us in the same home that we lived. In other words, if I'm going to fulfill the first and second greatest commandment, I am required to love these guys with the love of God. And God says, I want you to love them as Jesus loves you. Jesus came to you level. He tabernacled with you. He got dirty with you. He suffered with you. He lived with you. He, he showed you me in, in himself. And for the first 10 years of our ministry, me and Barbara lived at the Colonia house. Oh, wait a minute. You know why? Because if I'm going to love my neighbor, I need to have the desire that the same food that I eat, they need to eat. The same benefits that I, that I have, they need to have those same benefits too. The same roof that I live in, they have to live in there too. If not, why is Jesus going to prepare a place for me? He's going to be with me forever. He's going to have a knuckle with me forever. He's not going to kick me out. He's going to invite me in. So we wanted to live this gospel out ourselves before we can tell anybody about it. Was it easy? No, it was not. The first five years was nothing but hell. Every neighbor came against us. The city of Wheaton came against us. Every church came against us. Was it easy? Of course not. But God gave us one gift. Was the gift of endurance. Was the gift of perseverance. Was the gift that Jesus never gave up. How can I give up? How can I give up if my Jesus did not give up? So we began to see a glimpse of this text that I'm talking about of Joshua and Jesus. In, that's why I am so passionate about it. 
See, people want to love us from a distance. That's not love. That is not, that's not love. Love has to be up close and personal. What is mentorship? Mentorship is a word that we throw out so many times. I'm his mentor. Well, what do you mean by that? You are his mentor. What do you mean by that? Mentorship is this. It's called discipleship. It is living life together. We have to get used to each other now because we're going to be forever together. So I'm not trying to brag about ourselves. I'm just trying to tell you what it is. And to be very honest to you guys, for the last 18 years, it has been difficult to find people to do what we did. Very difficult, very frustrating. I mean, I could have quit so many times because this is a battle that we've been fighting for years. And we have an amazing board and I'm thankful for Chuck Martin and for Bob Wilson and for all of our board members. But not even them understand what me and Barbara have gone through together. That's why I get sometimes frustrated. So when you combine my Cuban culture with my frustrations and my disappointments, sometimes it feels like, but I'm not, because I'm a loving guy. I would do anything for you. I would do anything for you. Everybody that sends me a text, I text you back. Everybody that calls me, I call you back. If you need to, to meet with me, I will adjust my schedule and meet with you. I'm going to go out of my way to love you. Not because I have to, because I want to. You know why? Because I understand grace. I have been given much. To whom much is given, much is required. Last example, and I'm going to sit down. That man right there is my brother. Rodney Massey. Right there. Is my brother right there. He's been, I've known him for 20 plus years. I had the privilege of discipling him in prison for 20 years. He spent 25 years behind bars. And because of our laws, all the laws that we have today, because Let's be honest with each other. Society and the church don't want people in their midst that have been locked up. That's the truth. I mean, that's the truth. I don't have many churches that say, Manny, send me a guy out of prison to my church. I just don't have them knocking on my door. And I've been knocking on their doors for years. For years. But we want to love people from a distance. There's no love in there. There's no love in there. And then we cannot be loving people the way that we want to love them. We want to love them the way that they need to be loved. So, Rodney and I knew each other. And his case was a unique case that he had to register as an offender in the same registry that a sex offender has to be registered. And therefore, it was difficult to find him a place to live. But, but I was determined. We were determined. And th there was a loophole on the law, but we couldn't fix it right there and then because he had to be parole on the day that he had to be paroled. Otherwise, he had to stay three more years in prison. True? And I prayed and I called people and I said, Father, help us with this. Love is what? Creative. I could have said to Rani, Rani, I'm sorry. I tried. I did my best. 
but you know what? The law says this, Ronnie, I'm sorry. I keep, I keep coming to Danville and I keep seeing you there. That's not what we did. That's not what we did. We prayed. And when we pray, hallowed be thy name, big things happen. So God opened a door for him in Waukegan. And I never forget my friend Neftali Mara and I, and my friend Mr. Reynolds, we met him at the gate. He was so happy. He was jumping for joy. And I said, Rodney, don't mess up. And he hasn't. It's been out for four years. He's employed. Amen. <laughs> He's employed. He's helping people. He contributes to society. Helps other people as well. So I wanted to put two examples tonight of what it means to pitch your tent and to love your neighbor up close and personal by living with them. And also the other example of loving creatively because our Father is a very creative God. Yeah. He is. Right? Isn't he a wonderful creative God? Artistic, is it, right? I mean, look at his creation, right? So I want to encourage you tonight. And I'm going to close with this. Ask God to speak to you and to me too. And I said, Father, how am I loving you? And how am I taking that love to my neighbors? Am I willing to pitch my tent with my neighbor? Am I willing to love my neighbor creatively? And you know that the last five years, we've been fighting together in what are we going to do with the thousands of men and women who are in prison for a sex offense, I have no place to go. That is very hurting to me. Very. Because many, many of our churches will now work on them. Will now work on them. And it's very difficult for them to find housing, to find a job, to find anything and everything. So that is, that is a milestone that, that needs prayer. <laughs> that is prayer. Because only God can make that happen. You know what I'm saying? That's heavy on me. But for us here tonight, in a simple way, these next few days, ask the Holy Spirit to help you examine yourself, to take inventory of yourself and say, Father, am I really loving you? Am I really loving my neighbor? Am I loving conveniently? Am I loving from the excess? Am I loving with what I want to love? Am I loving you in a tabernacling way? Am I loving you creatively? Let us pray. So thank you, Father, for this. My family, my RTO family, thank you for their grace towards me tonight. And I pray, God, that as next week, I, I, I would like to do a little town hall next week. So I'm not going to be preaching next week. Next Thursday, I want to have a little town hall, a true interactive town hall where Joshua and Jesus will be here. Joshua will be here next Thursday. Jesus will be here next Thursday too. And we're going to have a real interactive town hall next week where we're going to be able to together interact on what I just talked about today and last Thursday and we're going to see what Joshua says about it what Christ says about it so we can be refined and we can have an open uh, town hall meeting here like a summit next Thursday here for 30, 40, 50 minutes together and we're going to help each other. We're going to sharpen each other. We're going to help each other in how to tabernacle and how to love creatively. So I pray that you will come back next week that you will invite others. This is July 5th 
and that together we will be able to hallow our Father in a greater way so we can cast this grandeur vision of the glory of our Father and that we will become more forgiven. We will become more gracious. We will become more Christ-like, more Joshua-like. We will become the man and the woman that God the Father wants us to be. So Father, with you love, with you love of my friends here tonight, because Father, you send Jesus that we will not perish. We don't want to perish. We don't want to go to hell. We want to be in heaven. And heaven is not just a place. Heaven is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. So we are in heaven. Even when we are in prison, we are in heaven when we know Christ. So Father, bless my family tonight. I'm so grateful for them. In Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen.